Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to have Griff Green here at the Define Podcast. So for those of you who don't know Griff, uh, Griff is one of the co-founders of Giveth, uh, which describes itself as, as a community-focused um, organization building the future of giving um, using blockchain technology. And so we'll get all uh, into all of that. Uh, but Griff is also just like a longtime member of the Ethereum and, and crypto community. Um, he has amazing stories about the DAO hack, and we will get into all of that as well. So welcome, Griff. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yay. Okay. Um, so just to start, uh, can you get uh, everyone up to speed on what uh, Giveth is and maybe just like the latest developments and then we'll get into your own story? Yeah. Giveth is a project that raised, uh, that rised out of the ashes of the DAO in 2016 and has a long, healthy uh, relationship in the Ethereum space where we supported a, a lot of projects over the years. And just uh, we've, we've the goal has always been for Giveth to kind of change the way that we coordinate around uh, nonprofit and and public services. So the there's you know this weird thing that you have to donate and you have to sacrifice to provide value to society. And we've always we want to change that. But mm -hmm. uh, and so we've tried various things over the years and actually spun out a, a project called the Common Stack that really goes at the at the like straight full on and tries to build economies around causes so that people can be rewarded instead of having to sacrifice to do good work. But Giveth's really focused on going the other direction of like starting with nonprofits, meeting them where they are, making it easy for them to onboard into the Web3 space, and then taking them on a journey and making a, a kind of a slippery slope until they can build their own DAO and their, have their own reputation and, and uh, uh, have their own economy that actually rewards the people who are doing good work on the ground for, for uh, you know, making the world a better place. And, and uh, yeah, so this is the, the dream of Giveth, but it starts where people are, right? Which is donations and, and uh, onboarding nonprofits to donations uh, in, in, to a donation platform that uses crypto. And that's the first step. And then, uh, and then we can take them down the path to the, uh, eventually where they will be able to be rewarded for their good work. That's, that's the dream. Got it. Perfect. Okay, we'll get into into that in more detail later in the conversation. But first, um, I would love to hear your story and how you got into crypto and how you got interested in this uh, crazy space. Sure. I mean, I'm a crazy anarchist from back in the day. Uh, I actually was bankless, as they say, uh, uh, in 2013, 2012, 2013, 2014. And uh, didn't have a bank account and just wanted to exit the financial system. And I heard about Bitcoin pretty early, uh, but didn't buy any, of course. Like, I think the first time I heard about Bitcoin, it was $5, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't buy any, of course, because uh, you had to wire money to Japan. And it's like, that, that sounded crazy. So I ended up getting into Bitcoin uh, by trading gold and, gold and silver for Bitcoin. Because I actually kept all my money in gold and silver instead of in bank accounts, right? Yeah, so phys physical. And and uh, and then I, I bought some Bitcoin, uh, $3,000 worth of Bitcoin in April of 2013, right after it crashed uh, in, in 2013, early 2013. And then by late 2013, uh, I was a massage therapist, actually. I was doing Thai massages mm -hmm. and my wrists were hurting. And uh, and then Bitcoin went to a thousand dollars, and I made twenty four grand. I was like, oh man, I could live off this for way over a year. Like, what is going on? Uh, and so I like stopped doing massage and basically just focused all of my time on. I became obsessed with crypto, and ended up uh, thinking I'm going to go to Ecuador and make uh, be the Andreas Antonopoulos of Ecuador. You know, uh, they use the U.S. dollar there. There's like this tax that anytime they send money out of the country that they have to pay 5%. So I was like, oh, what a great opportunity for crypto to circumvent the taxes, right? Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, after doing some community building there for a few months, I found out that Ecuador was going to make crypto illegal. So I didn't want to end up in a third world prison. So I left and stopped, mm -hmm. stopped that. And uh, while I was in Ecuador, I also started the first graduate program of 
digital currencies that ever existed. In fact, I think it's I think I have the first formal degree in digital currencies that anyone ever, ever got. Oh, yeah. I, I was in a group of nine people. We got a master's degree uh, in digital currencies. I was a chemical engineer before that, obviously way before I became a uh, crazy anarchist and all that. <laughs> but then uh, I really wanted to, I, I wrote a white paper about uh, building a sharing economy mm-hmm. on, uh, as, a, as a DAO, basically. At that time, it was, we were using the bit shares terminology, of like a, a decentralized uh, uh, autonomous uh, company. So we DAC, called it DAC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And then, uh, then we, I, I wrote this paper and I just was Googling, hey, is there someone doing sharing economy crypto stuff? And Slocket came up. Mm-hmm. And so I applied for a job with Slocket. They didn't respond. I begged and pleaded. I said I'd work for free. They didn't respond. Eventually, uh, like a few months of applying, sending them emails over and over again, they uh, eventually let me become their community manager. And then uh, we built uh, this really cool project called the DAO uh, as a, as a way, a means to an end to actually build the real pro- core project, which was the Universal Sharing Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's like a forgotten part of this thing was that we were going to build like a a sharing economy project where anyone could just put stuff in a locker and send ethereum to that locker to like fill a deposit you know and then that would open the locker they could get something out of it use it and then bring it back and get their deposit back and then eventually you know we dream of like drones being able to open the lockers for you and the drone itself has its own ethereum account that it'll release the, the thing out of the locker to you if if you pay the drone, you know, and, and there was all sorts of cool dreams there. But in the end, uh, we had a fatal flaw with the DAO uh, that even though we were probably, and we'll probably always be the most successful project on Ethereum in Ether terms, because we raised $150 million, which was at the time 14% of all Ether in existence. And... Uh, but then we had this fatal flaw where there was a bug and uh, one line should have been in front of the other. It was that simple. And uh, someone was able to hack us for about 4% of all Ether in existence, hmm. about $50 million. And then uh, we were able to, luckily, the, you know, we were able to coordinate the community to come together to hack the hacker and hard fork the network and actually take the money out of the hacker's hands and give it back to everyone. Uh, who uh, who was part of the DAO? So it was like a it was a really crazy time in Ethereum history for sure, and you know all about it. You know more than most. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks to you and Fred. I mean, you you kind of told me the the backstory for uh, for the book. It's I mean, so so far like your your story is just so incredible. Um, you know, like starting out as a chemical engineer, then. Uh, deciding to go bankless with all your money in like precious metals um i guess like after that you were like traveling the world right yeah where and and you had like yeah your your savings um in like gold and deciding to like put some of that in bitcoin um and then like going full on like oh well like going to ecuador then back to the States, becoming a massage therapist, then going full on Bitcoin or full on crypto. Um, and then that leading you to slog it. And then that leading you to being kind of um, at kind of this uh, group coordinating to save uh, the DAO uh, funds. Um, it's just like an amazing uh, Ethereum story, I think. Um, okay, so then, uh, you know, what what happened next? Um, basically, uh, all of you kind of listening probably know uh, the the DAO hack resulted in the split of of Ethereum and and Ethereum Classic. Um, Slugit basically, like I guess, like just like fizzled after that. Like you, from the Ethereum perspective, yes, but actually, <laughs> Slugit kept going. In fact, they're still alive today. That I don't know if you guys remember. If you remember, I think it was Prague where Blockchains LLC was like had all the ads everywhere. Yeah. So that organization actually bought Slugit, and only only about six months ago did Christoph Jens actually retire, and uh, 
uh, give Slock it up. But uh, they were they they built some really cool stuff. Oh wow! But nothing really public for the Ethereum community. But they mm-hmm. have this thing cubed system. Yeah, they, they they did really cool things. Uh, but it's yeah, it was never something like really prominent. You know, you okay. almost have to have a token to have any kind of like awareness in the space. It feels like it's true. So. It's true. <laughs> so so after the whole like um, DAO hack, what uh, what did you do after that? So I, yeah, during during the DAO hack, you know, uh, I met some really incredible developers, Jordi Bellina and and a few others that we we uh, we rescued the DAO funds. Uh, on mainnet and then rescued them on ETC as well. Mm-hmm. And them back to all the DAO token holders. We were the white hat group. And so after that, we were like, oh no, you know, we could see the writing on the wall. DAOs started to get a bad name. And uh, we wanted to make sure that DAOs didn't have a bad name, that they actually mm-hmm. uh, had a uh, more like, we feel like the DAO almost did, uh, had a negative impact on the movement of DAOs. Mm -hmm. And so we started Giveth in an effort to say, look, DAOs have the potential to change the way we coordinate around some of the most important issues of our time. Let's, let's, let's go straight at it. Let's try to get nonprofits to be DAOs and, and show what you can do when you use an economy to, to uh, actually solve problems as opposed to donations and taxes. Got it. Okay. So, so, so Giveth um, emerged directly after after the DAO. Like I, for some reason, I thought it was it was more recent than that, but it was like, was it like 2016? 2016. So we made, the, we made the Mini-Me token in 2016, which, which came out of the lessons of the DAO and is still used by every Aragon DAO that exists. Status used it for their token and a lot of other major projects use it. Uh, even Compound kind of took some of the ideas for it and all of the Compound style DAOs uh, are using the same strategy that Mini Me and Giveth came up with in 2016, oh, and then we actually built our first application. Had it where every time you donate, um, you get a token, and mm-hmm. uh, and then it was like, what do you do with the token? We don't know yet, but mm-hmm. you do something, right? But then in 2017, uh, ICOs went wild, and tokens sort of had a bad name. And we had brought in a bunch of nonprofit people to help us like understand their their perspective. And honestly, they kind of took us in the wrong direction. And they they were like, "No, uh, we don't want tokens. That's too commercial, and 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 ICOs are bad." So mm. we got rid of the tokens out of our our offering. And we've been running uh, a project called Giveth Trace since 2018. Uh, we actually launched it first just on Ethereum mainnet during the Crypto Kitties times. Mm-hmm. But gas was so bad that it would have cost a hundred dollars to create a campaign. So we charged like nonprofits a hundred dollars to create this thing, and it was like, mm. oh, we got to be able to do it cheaper than that. And so, and now now gas is even crazier. You would never yeah. want to even just yeah, it's ridiculous now. But um, so we ended up creating a scaling solution. We threw this conference called Scaling Now, and we actually created one of the first bridges off of Ethereum to another chain. Uh, uh, POA Network did it first, but then we basically did it second, but we bridged to Rinkaby. And so we oh. built a donation platform that uh, you would donate on mainnet, but then it, we'd bridge the tokens to Rinkaby and we do a bunch of stuff for the nonprofits on Rinkaby. And then when the nonprofit would want to claim its donation, it actually bridged from Rink- the accounting from Rinkaby over to mainnet where all the actual Ethereum tokens were stored and then be able to get the tokens. So we'd we could do all sorts of fun smart contract transactions for free, and then uh, and trace donations uh, to where they're where going and what they're being used for, and then uh, only have to pay gas when people donate and when people withdraw. So yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a really cool project, but honestly, it didn't get much traction. Uh, we I found out that traceable donations sound like something what people want, but actually, it's like not uh it's not uh, something that grabs people and and brings them into it mm-hmm. so we we uh simplified the product and went more of a gitcoin approach where it's just like you just donate straight to an address no smart contracts on the donation side and uh also launched it on xdi and so now we have giveth.io on mainnet and xdi and you can just donate straight to nonprofits and recently, what we launched very recently is uh, a givebacks program, 
So it's kind of like tax deductible donations, except without borders, without taxes, without governments, right? So unlike Gitcoin, where when you donate on Gitcoin, you're controlling a matching fund where the project gets the money. Mm-hmm. On Giveth, when you donate, uh, you get the money, right? You get paid to donate. So, uh, wow. and, and this is important for us because we actually want to create a, a, a donation platform governed by donors. So the donors control the platform. They control the direction of the system. And, and so to do that, whenever someone donates, they get a bunch of give tokens back. They get give tokens, liquid give tokens right away. And then they also get a stream, almost like a UBI for mm-hmm. five years where they get tokens every second streamed. Wow, through. very cool. Yeah. So. Um, what's what's the name of this latest iteration of Giveth? Well, we just call it giveth.io. Oh, okay. And, uh, that's the website. And it's it's easier to remember because we want people to go to the website. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. And then the program uh, where we give, give tokens back is called Givebacks. Got it. Okay, uh, I'll k- kind of want to get into this this like process of um, just like evolution of, of donations. Uh, but first, um, before we get too far away from your own story, I want to ask you um, this question that I'm trying to bring into all my episodes, which is what makes you defiant? Defiant? Well, I really don't. I, I, I just don't believe that we need governments to support us. I just don't believe it. I think that, I don't think that it's a problem. I think governments can provide a lot of value. I've, I've, I've seen, I I see, I have another perspective than what I had when I got into crypto, Mm -hmm. but uh, I really just refuse to believe. I, I refuse to believe that we cannot solve coordination failures around shared resources better than governments. I refuse to believe it. I know we can do it. Uh, I wish that we could do it. Like nonprofits are one way, but they rely mm-hmm. on donations and sacrifice in every direction. Mm-hmm. Governments are another way. They also kind of have bad incentive structures and a very top-down approach that ends up being inefficient and in many ways corrupt. I, I think that we can do it the same way the free market does it. With uh, but instead of using business models, we use economic models. And I'm I'm I you know. No one believes me, basically. I, I, I seem like the crazy person. I might as well be carrying a sign in the street, you know, and yelling at people. Because, uh, but I just, I know we can do it. Hmm. But, okay, when you mean we don't need government, what about, and I'm like also like lean libertarian. And so I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm sympathetic to your view. Um, but still, like, you know, like basic um government functions like um defense and protection mm-hmm. i mean do you think that should be coordinated uh, by like individuals as well or yeah or is that is that like okay for government i i so public goods right this is mm-hmm. like like national defense or public safety is usually how i like to frame it this is the, this is a concept of uh uh, where things are non-excludable and non-rivalrous, right? So if I have safety public in, in public, it, it doesn't impede on anybody else's privileges. And, uh, and if there is safety, for me, there's safety for everyone, right? Mm-hmm. So that means that we can't have a business model. There's no customers. And don't get me wrong. I, I, I actually think that governments, nonprofits, and economies, the Web3 focused economies are all great. Anyone who's providing a public good is fantastic. You know, mm-hmm. they're creating abundance for society. So I don't want to, I'm not saying we should overthrow governments. I'm saying that we should build systems that are better mm-hmm. and that can do it better. And na- national defense, you know, defending like a, a, a large perimeter of a country. That's going to take a long, a long time to outcompete a government. But maybe we could just start with building roads, you know, or doing other things that are a lot easier to coordinate around a smaller local locality and uh, like have smaller scope and issues if you get it wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I don't think that we go straight from, you know, uh, yeah, we don't need governments. Let's take them away because we have this solution. It's more like death by a thousand cuts. Let's mm-hmm. let's replace 
government services, monopolistic government services with competing public goods focused economies that actually can evolve to solve the problems that we want through market demand and market forces, but in ways that are competitive and, and uh, bottom up as opposed to top down, this is how it's going to be. Feedback takes four years for it to reach any kind of momentum change. And there's all sorts of political barriers and a lot of friction. Whereas if we have this, this system with competing micro economies, or it would be more like, you know, startups. I mean, like, no, look how much coordination it took to get this cell phone and this laptop into my hand. How many people and how much research uh, happened? It was a lot, a lot of work and a lot of coordination, but it happened effortlessly. And I'd say it happened effortlessly because every step of the way, people who were providing value were, were, were rewarded. Hmm. We had like profit as a shelling point. And we don't have that in the public goods space. We don't have a way to like slowly reward people who are doing good work at every, every step of the way. Hmm. It's just government saying, yes. Let's buy all these bombers and let's let's like build these. Let's give a billion dollars to this company to provide this service. It's 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 a different approach. Got it. Okay, so right now, public goods, the way that they are serviced is basically through taxes, right? Like governments collect uh, taxes from their peoples. Um, they they use that. Um, that money, those funds that they collect uh, through taxes to uh, distribute them in the way that the, I don't know, the different um, uh, groups within government uh, see fit. So uh, there's a budget for education, healthcare, defense, um, and so on. And and that's how kind of public goods are, are like serviced, like, mm -hmm. okay. Right, people kind of get together uh, and delegate those functions to to government. Um, now uh, and then, there's like also um, you know like private sector uh, donations, but I get th those aren't really public goods, or, or would you say they uh, donations? So like you know. Public goods is a very broad term. There's public services that governments provide. Mm -hmm. but anytime a public a, a government isn't is failing to provide a public service, usually a nonprofit actually steps up, right? Governments mm -hmm. provide clean water, but when they don't, like in Venezuela, there's an abundance of clean water charities. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And, and, and so, really, when governments fail, you see a lot of nonprofits uh, mm -hmm. because they're actually providing the same value. Uh, it, it effectively giving, um, collect, satisfying collective wants and needs. Mm -hmm. If you're satisfying an individual wants and need, you can create a business model because you have a ready-made customer. Mm -hmm. And so we can live in, uh, we live in individual luxury. I can mm -hmm. get a cell phone. I can get this, but I'm in Costa Rica right now and the roads are crap. They're dirt roads everywhere. We, we I, I can, I can go buy a computer, but I, I can't drive a I, my car the car that i have here is getting destroyed all the time huh. from like gravel and the road getting like it's like someone's shooting a bb gun at it constantly because the road's set <laughs> you know so it's uh you know this is a collective want and need that's unsatisfied mm -hmm. the government is mm, you know and when a road gets has a problem uh, uh this is actually in ecuador they call it a minga so they'll, mm -hmm. they'll call a minga and a bunch of people will have to come out take their day, their Saturday to go fix the road because the government's not going to do it. Wow. This is the individual sacrifice to satisfy collective wants and needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could solve this through economics, through through crypto economics. Right. Okay. Okay. So so there's the government. When the, the government, government fails, um, there are nonprofits that uh, step up and those nonprofits in, in the same way, Kind of the same way that the government is is funded through taxes, nonprofits are funded through donations. But in, in both cases, they require uh, people to just like give away uh, their their money um, because they value uh, public goods. They 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 understand that okay. Um, they also benefit from the the community as a whole uh, getting these um, these services. 
Um, I guess like in, in the case of taxes, that's forced on you. But in the case of, uh, of uh, nonprofits, those are that's voluntary. And, and so, yeah. yeah. And a big difference between donations and taxes is that donations still contain market information. Like when you donate, you're creating a signal. It's a it's a feedback that says, I want this. Mm. But when you're taxed, not only is the money taken from you, you also lose the feedback. You, you don't you, have a say on like how that money gets used. And and if we're and and the, what say you have is a vote every four years or something like that, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it, it's and it's not it's just inefficient, you know. It's it's not whether it's right or wrong. It's just missing an opportunity to give that information, you know, of like mm -hmm. this is what I want, and then aggregating those signals across every individual so that you could say like this is what we need because we have this information from everybody Got and it. yeah yeah okay and then so the next step is crypto like how does crypto f uh, fit into into this framework like how does it make things different so so crypto is an economic system right like bitcoin is being printed every 10 minutes and Uh, because of that, they can use that money to actually incentivize miners to validate and order transactions on the blockchain and create a single source of truth. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these blockchains are actually public goods. Anyone in the world mm -hmm. can create an Ethereum address or a Bitcoin address and participate in international finance, right? Pass value to each other and receive value from anyone in the world. It doesn't, it, it is non-rivalrous. If I create an address, it doesn't impede on anyone else's ability to create an address. And uh, and it's uh, non-excludable. No one can stop me from making a cryptographic hash and getting an address. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, these 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 crypto economies are public goods, or at least the, they serve public goods. And some of them serve more public goods than others, like PrimeCoin. It's an old cryptocurrency right? Mm -hmm. That to mine a block in PrimeCoin, you have to find a prime number. And PrimeCoin has found 35 million prime numbers or something ridiculous like that. And before we knew very few prime numbers, like less than less than 4 million for sure. I can't remember what the number was. But uh, so PrimeCoin is finding new prime numbers every day by printing money. Wow. This is actually a public good, right? Mm -hmm. It's not so important it's not nearly as important as like you know taking care of less fortunate in society but it is creating a public good through issuance through like an economic system that mm -hmm. has as part of its design it is effectively an economic game where you get points for making the world a better place and this is what i'm excited about i think we can create games uh, where collectives actually get to decide who gets points right so that we can have individual signal processing to actually give feedback on the public good that's being created and individuals who get those points well instead of a video game where the points are non-transferable and don't have any value um, we can use DeFi and we can use other liquidity management systems like bonding curves to uh, create Uh, uh, an actual liquid token that acts as the points and then uh, they can be used for satisfying their individual wants and needs. So mm -hmm. you can get a job through a DAO who's trying, who's a, a purpose driven economy that actually gives points for if you take care of homeless people, right? Take care of the homeless, earn some homeless tokens, and then you can sell those tokens for ether and then go buy, you know, pay your rent. Uh, and, And actually creating systems that can do that and create these economic games, uh, we can use the same techniques as business models do, which mm -hmm. uh, have just kind of evolved. Com competition, uh, you know, can, there can be uh, one homeless, a homeless shelter economy and the, the home, feed the homeless economy and, and maybe a larger like help the homeless economy. And they can all be com competing with each other in mm -hmm. some respects, same way restaurants would compete with each other. But then individuals get to decide, well, I like, uh, I think they, the most important thing is that the homeless are fed, right? Mm -hmm. No, I think the most important thing is that they have a house. No, we, they need all of it, you know, and, and people can, instead of donating to these economies, 
they can allocate their capital the same way they allocate their capital to Amazon or Google when they buy stock to invest. And so now we could actually in turn donors into investors and turn volunteers into shareholders that actually earn earn a revenue and earn points, you know, shares in there and a decision power in in the system that they're working with. This is really cool. I, I okay, so give us um, innovation in the public goods um, like design is that Instead of relying on um, on people to uh, voluntarily uh, give part of their money to uh, different organizations that, that they like, um, you are rewarding uh, those uh, contributors, both uh, donors and volunteers, uh, with shares of of those organizations. Yeah. I mean that's the that's the end goal. The end goal right. is that we we take a nonprofit to the point where they can have their own DAO. Uh, for now, we just reward donors. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, give its starting point is, you know, if you donate to a project, you get a bunch of give tokens given to you and streamed to you over time. It's the first time in the history of donations that there's an upside. <laughs> you know? Like, you could actually make money by donating, uh, and that's and I think. Cool. Yeah, I, I think it's a huge, huge leap forward. But mm -hmm. then, you know, it's going to take a lot of time and research on how to build these. You know, like it's really easy to make prime coin because it's you can prove there's tricks that you can use to prove that you made a prime number. Right. So but it, how do you prove that you're helping the homeless? Mm. Uh, and how do you how do you turn that into a thing? It's actually more of a culture culture kind of issue it's a community building issue than it is a technical issue and so i lose a lot of people in crypto honestly because i think the cultural build of communities is is the real like where we really need to move towards how do you how do you build a community what like how do you create uh cultural norms to the point and, and also like design the in uh, the rewards mechanisms so that people are happy to live within this thing and it doesn't become some sort of dystopian The economic prison, you know, where you're like, you know, trapped in some game that you don't want to play. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of there's there's a lot of uh, ways this can work or not work. I mean, even look at Bitcoin. It's it's it created an economic game. And but they set up the rules so that the higher the Bitcoin price goes, the more electricity people are willing to purchase to mine Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's it's like not the best token engineering, honestly. You know, it was the first crypto ever, and, and they, they did the, a great job, and it's incredible. And I'm not saying that it's really that much of an issue, but it could have been designed a little bit better so that it doesn't burn so much electricity when the price goes up. Uh, right. Um, I mean, do you believe proof of stake? I mean, this is kind of off topic, but just like curious, do you think proof of stake solves that? Yeah. I mean, I think proof of anything can solve that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's proof of. Uh, I also think you could design a proof of work such that it doesn't scale linearly with the price, how much electricity people want to buy. But mm -hmm. maybe a, as the price goes up, it like the difficulty goes up at a different rate, and it doesn't, you know, makes it makes it, it doesn't make it so hard to mine bitcoins, you know. And you mm -hmm. can you could you could design it a little bit different, but unfortunately, the Bitcoin network. Uh, you know, the challenge with decentralized culture is that it's really hard to change if you don't have a leader. And so with Bitcoin, I, I think they took the approach of like, well, hey, who's going to decide this is right? How about we just not change anything ever because Satoshi doesn't exist, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, that means that we can't change this in Bitcoin. Right. right? We, can't, we can't change the difficulty algorithm to make it less energy intensive. So the, the, the goal here is to design a decentralized network um, that uh, m where, where the outcomes are, um, are, are just more, more positive towards everyone involved, including the environment, including kind of the planet. Yeah. But uh, um, I would but, say microeconomies. Yeah. So like, Mm -hmm. Instead of it being like, oh, yeah, look, this is the one economy that solves all of our problems. Mm 
mm-hmm. having building systems that are reproducible that can be repeatedly built for different causes, Got even it. small causes, roads in this town, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, and you could even have two groups that are trying to build roads in this town competing to provide that value. And, and then, you know, then maybe one succeeds more than the other. This one still stays in this town, but this one actually grows into the state, you know, and, and, Mm -hmm. and the people who invested in this early have upside because this economy is growing and this economy didn't grow. It's still surviving. It's like a small business, you know, and this is a larger business that grew. And so like, uh, because of these dynamics, like if, the value that's being created is is uh, received well by uh, a community, then and then it spreads to a larger community and a larger community. Then you can actually make money by providing value, uh, providing value that normally would only be provided by governments and and nonprofits. Got it. Um, okay, so going going back to uh, give it specifically, so. Um, so, so like this evolution, it, it started out as, a, like you said, from kind of the ashes of, of the Dow um, to make a, 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 a new Dow that uh, in, enabled uh, donations and, and giving. Um, initially, it did have a token that went back to, uh, to donators, but then when you started uh, working together with nonprofits, and because it was like post ICO uh, era, uh, you like took the tokens away, um, and then uh, that didn't work. Um, and then you you like reintroduced tokens. Uh, this was like around when uh, was this like the mini me token? Well, so we made the mini me token in 2016, but okay. now we launched the give token on Christmas uh, just a month ago. Oh, so like the the reintroduction of tokens was just now recently? Yeah, and it's just our token. We haven't introduced Mm -hmm. tokens for every project yet. Got Uh, it. Okay. We're we're really, Giveth has splintered off into many groups. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I really like this idea of scaling horizontally. Instead Mm -hmm. of just everything is Giveth, you know, it's like, oh, we spin off the common stack. We spin off DAP node. We spin off Bright ID. We spin off these other groups that that have their own org and their own, you know, micro economies is the mm-hmm. dream. Not like one Facebook that provides all your value, valuable public services. So, mm-hmm. but uh, what, what Giveth is going to do, our, our goal is we start with givebacks, right? And we have this, a really nice roadmap mm-hmm. where after give, uh, while, while we're doing givebacks and going through this roadmap, we have the common stack doing applied research. So the Common Stack launched our first uh, uh, micro economy around a public good. That's very strategic. The public good we want to create is token engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to advance token engineering. That's the mission of the token engineering commons. And it's the first micro economy out of the Common Stack to launch, uh, launched very recently. And uh, it's already funded a few like a uh, token engineering academy and uh, will build other tooling, it raised about a million dollars for public goods in the TE space at launch. And uh, hopefully it'll grow because uh, with the token engineering commons, it has this augmented bonding curve, which mm-hmm. was first published on the Giveth medium. And, you know, then we spun up the common stack to take it to fruition. Uh, the augmented bonding curve, anytime someone mints, uh, mints tokens through the bonding curve, then a portion of the funds actually go to public goods. Okay. And anytime someone burns a token uh, to sell the token, then it actually sends some of the funds to public goods. So Mm -hmm. it's this like supply discovery mechanism that is funding public goods whenever it's interacted with. So it's kind of allows market volatility to actually uh, fund charitable forces, which is great because this is a win-win. People, it's not really a donation. It's the only way to create the token. You only have one option. It's 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 uh, by minting this uh, this token through the bonding curve. You are funding public goods, and oh, and then we build reward systems, and we we're we're using the TEC and Common Stack as a playground to understand how do we build cultural like purpose-driven economies that can actually provide public goods. Sorry, I got lost. What's what's TDC? 
TEC is the Token Engineering TEC. Commons. Oh, okay. Common Stack, mm-hmm. which is out of Giveth, uh, is is building kind of a framework for building micro economies. Mm-hmm. Token Engineering Commons is our first micro economy. Okay. Right, and now the Common Stack will try to build more using the same framework. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we were very embedded in the token engineering comments because we're also a token engineering community group, mm-hmm. right? But now we're going to, uh, you know, uh, we learned a lot of lessons and we'll continue being part of the token engineering comments because we care about the token engineering world. But we are going to start spinning up other commons as well. But they're not going to be focused on token engineering. They'll be focused on crypto UBI or you know, other other kind of Web3 focused things because it's still a complicated system, right? Mm-hmm. We have a complicated voting system. We have a complicated... Uh, uh, but it, it's all research. So that's kind of the research arm of Give It. Yes. Okay, that will go and investigate how to better design all the like complicated things that are like making crypto work. I would say Block Science does the research. Common mm-hmm. Stack does, uh, which is another group uh, with Michael Zargam doing amazing work. And mm-hmm. then... Common Stack does applied research, so we apply mm-hmm. the research and try it out and learn the practical issues with the idealistic assumptions, right? Okay. And then and and actually figure out how do we do this in a legal way, you know, these okay. sorts of things, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Giveth is watching all of this and making it palatable for nonprofits. Okay. So, yeah, I, so, I can so, I can run yeah. through the Giveth like ramp if you'd like later. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but uh, just like to clear up, what do you mean by like making it palatable to non profits? Just like uh, uh, marketing, selling it to them, or like doing like business debt, like reaching out? Like, what exactly does it do? Education. Making it dumb. Making it like, I mean, think about the the, the audience of the token engineering commons. It's a bunch of people that I don't have to show how to use MetaMask. OK, mm-hmm. you know, they, they I don't have to explain how bonding curves work. They know they're totally right. engineers. Mm-hmm. Right? They're very not the same as nonprofit people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, 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 the groups that just want to end global warming or, you know, take care of puppies. They're like meta what? Mm-hmm. I, well, I don't I don't I don't think so. You know, <laughs> uh, like like with Giveth, you can actually uh, as a nonprofit, you can log in with Google and start raising funds using a Taurus wallet, which which you use a Google login, right? Mm-hmm. But then, you know, when they raise some money, we tell them, hey, do you know Google can just steal your money? Like, maybe you should get MetaMask. Mm-hmm. And then they have an incentive to learn, right? And so we're trying to build this, like, stepping stone path for them mm-hmm. to hop from, you know, one step to another, to where the end goal is they have the same thing the token engineering commons has, but they'll have it through a different system where a lot of it is like rewriting some of the, the like systems assumptions that they have in their head, you know, that like in the for-profit space, win-win is everything. You're looking for the win-wins. Mm-hmm. The nonprofit space, you're like the world wins and, and we lose and donors lose. You know, it's mm-hmm. a, and that, that framework, that foundational framework is something that's going to take time to rewrite in the nonprofit culture. Mm-hmm. And, and so for each nonprofit that comes through our platform, we try to create these systems where like, actually, look, you're looking for win-wins, you know, and, mm-hmm. and we also want to make sure that they can actually start rewarding their volunteers, right? Rewarding people for doing good work. And these systems aren't built in most nonprofits. It's like uh, we just figure out who will do it for non-financial rewards, mm-hmm. which is great, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that. Let me just say, I, I'm a big fan of nonprofits. Is why I'm here, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's um, to to integrate the system, the systemic change. We need to actually advance as a society, and not just fucking burn ourselves into the ground, we're, we're, we're going to need to have some like, you know, thought changes, thought processes changes on the people on the ground, uh, because it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's a different system. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I do think you, you're right that 
non nonprofits and public goods become more sustainable if uh, people who are donating and contributing and volunteering get something out of it, like uh, are rewarded for it. it. It makes a lot of sense. So, okay, so uh, so Giveth allows um, like onboards uh, nonprofits into this system, right? And mm -hmm. and you do it through um, uh, ways that are familiar to them. Uh, like like Google uh, logins and um, and then like do they do they get like a, a regular bank account like how do they like access their funds? So we're not we we're integrating with groups that will like um, specifically the Giving Block. Every Giving Block project is on our platform. There's another group called Change, and they're they're they make it so they'll do uh, processing for um, crypto into nonprofit bank accounts. Mm. Right. And so uh, we do have this last mile solution solved for many, especially 501c3s in the States. It's pretty easy, but for other nonprofits, uh, it's a lot harder. And but that doesn't that doesn't help us, honestly, so much. Mm. We want them to get stuck in crypto like that. <laughs> we're, we're not looking for the, we're not just trying to extract value out of the crypto community. We're trying to bring nonprofits into the crypto community. So right. like giving them a last mile solution doesn't actually help us achieve that goal so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm at, what, what's cool about Giveth is the solution we're saying is like if you have international donors, uh, you can't give them a tax deduction, right? Because they're paying taxes somewhere else other than your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and what if you're just a really cool guy in Venezuela making water filters, you know? Uh, and you take pictures of how you're providing this value to society uh, and you post it on on uh, on f Facebook, probably. Right. But ideally, we're trying to get them to post on Twitter because um, mm -hmm. that's where the crypto people are. Mm -hmm. And you can show, look, I'm doing this work. I'm, I'm fixing people's water filters for free and I'm providing a valuable service to my community. Well, wouldn't it be great if anyone could donate crypto? And get the same rewards that they get from like donating to a nonprofit in their own jurisdiction through a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're creating. We're creating a system of uh, we're basically repla replacing the 501c3 service that the, the U.S. government provides with a Web3 solution. We're replacing a government service with a which is, um, sorry the, the government service is a tax deduction. Yeah. Okay. Subsidizing so we, donations. Right. Um, and so that subsidy would now come through this bonding curve that means okay, tokens. So, so we have to we have to there's there's two things going on. There's the give okay. a platform economy, which is uh -huh. the give economy, right? And then there's the individual micro economies we want to create for projects. So it, micro economies need bonding curves for liquidity. This is the, mm -hmm. the idea, right? And uh, Giveth is actually a relatively large economy. And so we don't need a bonding curve to start. We can do it mm. through uh, liquidity mining. So there's awesome liquidity mining rewards out there for give token holders to provide liquidity. But if you're a small nonprofit with like a, what would be a market cap of under 500K, liquidity mining isn't going to cut it. Uh, you just have small liquidity. So you need a bonding curve uh, to solve your liquidity issues. I, I don't necessarily... Go look up bonding curves. They're super mm -hmm. cool. We don't need to go into the technicals of them so much. But actually, you know, with just the small time that I have, maybe I could run through how we'll build the micro economies on Giveth. Yeah, yeah. So first project comes in, they they log in with Google and they and Giveth looks just like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, GoFundMe, or any other thing that they've ever used, right? Okay. They create a project. And then they raise some money. We're only going to help projects that succeed on the platform move forward. This mm -hmm. is their, a, a curation project process, right? So when they start to succeed, they start to raise money. We try to give them educational resources. Say, hey, did you know Google can steal your money? Get MetaMask, right? Okay, you got MetaMask. You're still raising funds. Awesome. Did you know that your donors, every time they donate to you, they're getting give tokens? We want to create a curation system where give token holders can stake their give tokens and lock it for a period of time and earn rewards for locking it. But they mm -hmm. also earn governance power uh, for locking it and they can use their, their give power. We still haven't gotten all the names solid yet mm -hmm. for these things. Uh, and they can use the voting rights to actually 
choose their favorite projects on the platform and then curate the projects that are good on the platform. The ones that have a lot of uh, give stakes behind them will actually end up getting uh, featured on the platform. They'll get the donors to those projects will get more give tokens back. And we're going to create a matching system where the curation, the voting power, the matching is determined based off of that. So instead of like quadratic matching through Gitcoin, which we also want to incorporate eventually when when Gitcoin figures it out for us, our very good <laughs> friends at Gitcoin, uh, we'll definitely do quadratic funding. But uh, we're also trying to use give token governance over curating projects on the platform. And when uh, what's really cool with that is now all of their donors get give tokens. So they can go to their donors and they can give the donors an, an opportunity. They can say, hey, let's find a win-win. You know, you stake your give tokens, you earn a yield. It's super cool. The donors get educated about DeFi, right? Mm -hmm. The nonprofits get educated about DeFi and they can start offering win-wins to their donors, right? Mm -hmm. super cool. Now, the projects that get a lot of give tokens staked behind them, we're going to start pulling them out. And we're going to say, hey, how about we build a reputation system for your community? This, uh, let's, let's start rewarding people with a, with a reputation token. So your volunteers start getting a reputation token. The donors, the, the volunteers get a reputation token. And the, the paid employees get a reputation token. And, and you start distributing out who is actually providing labor and expertise within your community. And once they have this reward system in place uh, with non-transferable, non-monetary tokens, uh, and if they raise enough give tokens locked behind them, we can actually initialize a bonding curve with this the, the money, the give tokens that are locked behind their project. So now we can ha create a micro economy that's backed by give token collateral. Uh, and uh, what's really cool with bonding curves is they're under collateralized. So with let's say $100,000 worth of give tokens, we could actually make a, t a project token. Let's say it's grassroots economics, really cool project uh, in Kenya that actually works with bonding curves with people on the ground. One of my favorite projects in crypto. Uh, they, they have, uh, they, let's say that they have their give tokens locked in what we call a GIRV, a bonding curve uh, that is in Giveth. And uh, their, their GIRV creates grass econ tokens. So with 100K worth of give tokens, that can collateralize 400K worth of grass econ tokens. And the donors can get, uh, the, not the donors, but the actual, the stakers, the, the people who lock their give tokens in this bonding curve, they can get, they locked 100K, they can get 200K back. Super cool. They all win. They made money on paper, right? Wait, wait, how, how did they, they get that money back? Uh, it's it, bonding curves work just like uh, just like an IPO, right? Mm -hmm. and, or any other under collateralized like market economy. Uh, if you have uh, like Amazon, for instance, raised 50k or 50 million dollars in their IPO, selling 10 percent of their stock, mm -hmm. right? and then the, and then with that 50k, they actually created 500 million dollars, half a billion mm -hmm. dollars. Jeff Bezos is now one of the richest men in the world because he got half of that in his back pocket. Mm -hmm. Nothing. He didn't sell it. He didn't do anything. They they raised fifty million dollars by selling their shares, and then they created half of a billion dollars. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Bonding curves use something similar, but it's actually all transparent. There's a hundred k here, and it's collateralizing four hundred k worth of tokens. Right. So uh, that means a, a reserve ratio of twenty five percent. So when someone sells $100, the market cap will go down $400. If someone buys $100, the market cap will go up $400. Mm. So you have this on paper, the market cap, I, I call it the market cap illusion. Market caps are really manipulative to people's minds. And I think it's some financial dark magic that I have to even create this word. There's no word for the fact that a market cap means nothing. But, mm -hmm. you know, I call it the market cap illusion. There's no financial term that's the closest one is slippage. There's some okay. slippage, right? <laughs> uh, and that's that's the closest thing to this financial dark magic that we call market caps. Uh, the market that I call the market cap illusion. But it's still very, um, you know, it still aligns incentives. It still gets people thinking 
that like they and, and it, it does it, it shows that while you're investing there is a risk mm-hmm. you lose money but you put in 100k you get 200k worth of value right on paper mm. and the the people who are part of their rep- reputation system let's say they get 100k all airdrop to them like tokens right and then <clears throat> the project gets 100k that it can collectively govern with their DAO. Right. So now, mm-hmm. but all of those tokens are locked. No one can sell any tokens right away. Hmm. So they're locked, let's say for six months. Then no one mm-hmm. can sell any. And then maybe for three years, they're slowly unlocked. Mm-hmm. So now, but now there is a bonding curve sitting there. People can invest in this nonprofit. Uh, they can, if they believe in grassroots economics, now they can use give tokens to actually buy tokens in this in in this charity and receive upside uh, if they succeed at their mission, right? And and uh, what's really cool is that when people donate, because donations aren't bad, they're just not the only solution, right? Right. So when people donate to grassroots economics, 100% of the donation still goes to grassroots economics. Maybe mm-hmm. they start building a liquidity pool on the side mm-hmm. with some of those donations, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who knows? Or maybe they just continue to use it to do their good work. But uh, then the when people donate, they get givebacks, right, on our platform. But now those give tokens, they don't just go to the person that donated. They actually go into the bonding curve. And anytime you buy the bond, uh, tokens in a bonding curve, the price goes up. So now the givebacks go into the bonding curve, raise the price of the token for everyone, right, and the, the donor actually gets project tokens. Now, the donor is an investor in that project. They, if, if the project's token economy grows, they succeed along mm-hmm. with the, everyone else because all the volunteers and exp- all the people contributing labor and expertise and capital are being rewarded through this token economy. And that's what it takes we have to reward the people with expertise who are contributing expertise, labor, and capital. We have to reward all of them and create a win-win system so that these nonprofits can actually advance without relying on sacrifice, you know, that they can advance and compete with, you know, government services, which is mm-hmm. a hard which is a hard thing to compete with. Oh wow, like this is this is awesome. Like it's um I think it's it's such an innovative system. I right now, like, where are you in in that process? I guess like these micro economies with with their own own uh, bonding curves and tokens, they're not live yet, right? Like, are are you in the process of just like like curating these uh, these projects and like having people like stake uh, give tokens on like which ones they like? This is a, there's a lot of applied research, so that. First bonding curve is live, right? It's okay. not through give it though. Give oh. it not through nonprofits. It's the token engineering commons. Yeah. Token engineering <laughs> commons is the applied research, right? Commons mm-hmm. is doing the applied research and we launched the first bonding curve, right? Nice. But it's not a curve with give tokens backing it. It's actually using XDI, right? And mm-hmm. like DAI. So it's just backed by the US dollar, but the decentralized US dollar that MakerDAO creates, right? So mm-hmm. uh, so we have that system going and it's super cool and we're learning a lot. We're, mm-hmm. we're also building a whole reward system that's backed by gratitude. Uh, so you can dish praise to people. Mm-hmm. And so when you and when you dish praise, we collect all the praise. And so, uh, and then every two weeks, it gets quantified by the community and as well as like using source cred to track GitHub contributions and discourse con- like contributions on the forum, Twitter contributions, who goes to meetings, all the things that we can quantify. That's those are we have bots that measure that stuff. But mm-hmm. that qualitative contribution is something that nonprofits have a lot of trouble rewarding, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we've built this whole reward system research program. That's in partnership with Common Stack, TEC, Giveth, and another group called General Magic. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of people involved in it. Ocean, mm-hmm. Near, uh, there's a whole re- reward system research group that's going on with the TE Academy. Lots of lots of work is being done on the research side, right? Uh, and and that's really important before we yeah. get there. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Right now with Giveth, we just have give backs. Okay. And we're building the specification for the curation system. It's mm -hmm. on our forum. You can go read it. Uh, mm -hmm. it's the first, the first draft, going through advice process, getting feedback, uh, and we're going to design it. And it shouldn't be so hard. Uh, we have a deadline of getting that out uh, when our farming rewards end, which is mm -hmm. about five months from now, mm -hmm. uh, in June or July. Uh, I think end of June. And so that's our deadline to get curation out. Uh, so that we can kind of move into that system. It's also our deadline to get more liquidity uh, held by our own protocol. And then uh, and then we're going to move to, uh, with that curation, we're going to move to implementing the reward system uh, into communities that are succeeding through a project. And then we'll implement GURVS, which is the, the dream, the end, the end goal. And along that way, we're going to implement matching programs and causes. And we have a lot of other cool things that, that we can gamify the nonprofit space uh, and improve it with Web3 tooling that in ways that philanthropy had never seen before. You know, uh, this is the this is why we say we're building the future of giving, and and the future of giving is is actually uh, regenerative. That's 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 the secret. What do you mean by that? I, I mean, actually, when you give, you'll receive more than. You ah, give. okay. It, yeah, it, yeah. We we need to build positive sum games. Right now, philanthropy uh, giving is a negative sum game. You know, everyone mm -hmm. is giving, and and it ends up they end up losing. And we need to make it so that the people who are giving are actually receiving more than they gave, and that's effectively investing. You know, uh, right? And sometimes you lose, sometimes you win, but. In the end, there's a positive sum game that's capable, possible there. Right now, you donate to a nonprofit, you, you always lose. And this is why Give It can't fail, because we're competing with donations. You know, we can't lose because <laughs> everyone's already losing. The bottom is on the floor. You know, mm -hmm. so like uh, if if we create economies where people are still losing money. It's better than donations. It's already, you know, we can't, we really can't lose. So I feel Amazing. pretty good about us. Amazing. Um, do you, I mean, what's the timeline? Like you said the the creation implementation should be out by like in, in five months. Like wh when do you see like the, the en entire uh, project will be live? I, I wish I could say, you know, it, it's a research. There's too much research that still needs mm -hmm. to be done. And, and a lot of it, honestly, is kind of waiting on the universe or, you know, <laughs> I, I put some of these things on the universe's to do list, like making crypto easy for your mom to use. I, <laughs> I'm not going to solve that problem. You know, there's mm -hmm. amazing teams like my crypto, MetaMask, Rainbow Wallet. You know, there's so much innovation in the wallet space that needs to happen to get to the point where people who work in nonprofits who are allergic to technology can actually use this like they use Facebook, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, so all these people are on Facebook. We can, if we can make crypto as easy to use as Facebook, then, then I can launch curves and scale it, you know, but uh, <laughs> I, I hope, I honestly hope it's, it's sooner than that because I don't know when that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll, we, we can launch Curves. We just won't be able to scale it. So yeah, you know, yeah. I think for open source projects and people who are a little more tech savvy, it'll be fine. But the people who really just want to help the homeless uh, in the streets of Denver, they're, you know, I, ta I, I say that because I, I wor I'm working with this guy who's really awesome, who does that mm -hmm. work in Denver. And mm -hmm. he's, he's savvy, but trying to get the people he works with to... Uh, to adopt this kind of tech is, and to solve their problems is it's, we have a long road ahead. I'm yeah, okay. we do. We do. I, I mean, just like to wrap up for, you know, people who want to uh, start doing maybe an MVP version of this. I mean, do you think maybe like the current DAO structure uh, can support something like this. I, I feel like the, the kind of tooling that, um, that, that DAOs are using now, um, maybe it's conductive to to doing like a small scale experiment in this way like i, I feel like mm -hmm. there's like yeah like there's a lot of like a rewarding mechanisms going on right now with DAO contributors i mean do you think that that can be like a, a bridge to towards like the the full-fledged solution that's exactly what we're trying to do with the common stack so it's mm -hmm. like giveth it's going to take a long time before our our audience which is nonprofits on the ground today doing good work 
It's going to mm-hmm. take time for them to use this tooling. But, you know, young people who are just just that, that have that have a lot more technical savvy. Uh, but maybe they yeah, honestly, I really believe in the nonprofits ability to solve major problems because they know the problem. You know, mm-hmm. they have wisdom. They have the wisdom of how do we help the homeless in Denver? You talk to the people that are helping the homeless and have been for 20 years. You know, mm-hmm. those are the people that know the solution. But they don't know Web3 yet, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, we can start up some nonprofit DAOs that will do cool things, right? But they're they're going to solve the problems not quite – they won't have the wisdom. We need need to get to the the people that are on the ground that know the right solutions, you know? Uh, and, and I think we can do lots of experiments and the common stack is going to do awesome experiments. Like, like I really believe I, I'm so excited for a crypto UBI commons, right? Like in a crypto, like we could build a, a micro economy around supporting crypto UBI projects, hmm. for instance, they will all be cool with using bonding curves you hmm. know? and we can build lots of projects like that. And then we can also start to scale out into smaller groups of tech savvy people that want to like even just take care of a river outside the town, right? And, and they could build a microeconomy that they will work with. And, and maybe they, they have some like, uh, uh, like some experience with the water, you know, uh, I don't know, the science, the science of studying the waters and the rivers, right? Like they can, they could apply that technology there and, and maybe even start up a, a successful commons is what we call these economies, uh, mm-hmm. these DAOs, right? Uh, but for it to scale, like for it to actually start competing with government services and for it to actually start competing with a non nonprofits even, uh, I think it's going to take time. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have to be uh, patient, but experiment in the meantime. Exactly. And, and, <laughs> nice. and if you want to experiment, the common stack is going to launch. Like, check out the TEC. And if you like what you see, like uh, the common stack hopes to launch three to five more commons over the next year and a half, uh, starting one at a time, you know, so we can kind of like scale our team a little bit Mm -hmm. uh, and our resources. But um, so, yeah, we're looking to start more. And we're, Mm -hmm. we're, and Giveth is definitely, if you know any nonprofits that you would like to donate to and get give tokens in return, bring them to Giveth. You know, don't, you could just send them crypto or you could send them crypto and get give tokens back, right? So like bring them to Giveth uh, on, uh, help us like throw throw nonprofits into our cycle uh, on our onboarding cir- circle, and then uh, we can we can start getting them to be Web three knowledgeable slowly Perfect. over time. Awesome. Okay. Well, Griff, this has been amazing. Uh, really, thanks so much for taking the time. Really cool what you're doing. It it really is uh, amazingly just innovative and like revolutionizing giving and donations and and public goods so um yeah i'll be looking forward to seeing how how this evolves and yeah thanks again it's been a real pleasure thanks so much it was really fun it it was almost as good as last time that we hung out (laughs) nice all right bye bye